Good morning. Welcome to worship on this day. This is the time when we gather the community and we share announcements, things that we want each other to know. This is not prayer concerns, which we also gather and want each other to know, but this is announcements. If you have an announcement and you're in the room, would you come to this mic, please? This next weekend, we will be hosting a consultant who is coming to talk to our church about how we move forward as God's people. Um, she will be meeting with a choir Thursday evening. Friday, she will be meeting with community leaders to see what some of the uh, missions in our area, some of the unmet needs, and how we may be of assistance there. And on Sunday, she'll be meeting with members of our congregation. So we have a sign-up sheet for sessions before the service. 8.30 to 10 would be that, and you would be offered breakfast with that. And then there's a 11.30 to one group that we will offer a light lunch as well. So I have the clipboard here. If you've not already signed up, please put your name down on one of these groups where we have two sessions going on simultaneously. Joy is going to train some of the EBC members to do this facilitation also. So if you're not in her group, you'll be with one of somebody you, you already know. Um, so I have the clipboard. Um, I'm happy to pass it around, but if you don't sign up, you may get a call this week. Yeah, that was a promise, not a threat. Um, some mornings when I wake up and I read the times, um, I get overwhelmed with the feeling that there is nothing I can do about what is going wrong in the world. And I want to remind myself and remind all of us that there is something we can do. We can contribute to the World Mission Offering, which does give money directly to our representatives who serve people overseas, who serve in places like the Dominican Republic and Nicaragua and in Ukraine. Um, that's a real gain. It's a real help. They know what to do. They speak the language. And when I feel helpless, there are helpers there that I can offer assistance to. So please remember the World Mission Offering. You can give here in the plate, um, or you can give online on the website under Special Offerings. Thank you. Good morning. Um, I brought in uh, a variety of greeting cards that were uh, the Jane received in the mail from various nonprofits. Uh, there are a lot of them. Uh, there are birthday cards and uh, get well cards and Christmas cards and blank cards. So please take as many as you want. Take them all, please. <laughs> Good morning. I'm sure by now everyone has opened your bulletin because if you haven't, there is this lovely notice, thank you Marilyn, um, regarding this Friday the 28th about a Halloween party. Now I know you're all thinking, oh well that's for the kids. No, I'm dressing up. Um, so come one, come all. We've got some really cool festivities and some really cool food. Thanks. Oh, and I know Dorothy's on vacation. I'm going to ask her about parking in the back from 5 to 8, which I will ask her to send out an EBC announce to let you know if that can happen or not. Thanks. We have Zoomers with us today. Is there anybody on Zoom who has an announcement? Um, okay, I think maybe there's not anybody on Zoom with an announcement. 
When we start to worship, when music starts, you might notice that Michael is not with us today. He is not feeling well, unfortunately. Michael is almost never unwell. So, um, but in his absence, the, the, the only silver lining to his absence is that we get to hear Beth Malone play. We haven't got to hear Beth in a long time. So Beth, thank you. <laughs> Beth says she hasn't heard herself in a long time either. Um, thank you, Beth, for, for being here, for pitching in on uh, short notice. We really appreciate it. Friends, let us worship. Good morning. Please join me in the call to worship found in your bulletin. We look in the mirror and what do we see? We see people who try to be faithful, even as questions and struggles challenge our faith. We look in the mirror and how do we see? which are open to God's love, which lives would seek to trust, and all the evidence tells us to be foolish. We look in the mirror, and who do we see? We see Jesus, the one who struggles with the question and models faithfulness for all who would follow. Join in singing hymn number 684, Faith begins by letting go.
You may be seated. Let us pray. Faithful and loving God, we bring our fragmented lives into the presence of your wholeness. We bring our wandering thoughts into your eternal light. We bring our restless spirits into your calming strength. May we remember that all we have comes from you and that you have trusted us with all that we are. Help us now to quiet ourselves, to hear your voice. Give us hope and courage to act with justice and with love. We pray in the name of Jesus who taught us to pray, our Father and Mother who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Children, I would invite you to meet me in the center of the room. Good morning. So, when Tony's here, you get to hear a little man's story, and most of the time when I'm here, we read a book. But I wanted to tell you a little bit about how we came to read this particular book. We are talking right now um, about giving, about different things that we give, that we share with each other, things like truth, and wellness and money, lots of things that we give back and forth to each other. And so this book was actually a gift to me from my friend Bien. She gave it to me and I wanted to share it with you. So that's one reason I'm reading this book. The other reason that I'm reading this particular book today is because, um, I don't know if you heard it, but Judy just said that we are taking something called the World Mission Offering. And that money goes to um, empower people in all kinds of places around the world. And this book was written by two church leaders, two spiritual leaders from um, different places in the world. And it's about children in different places of the world. And the best thing about it is it has the most beautiful pictures. So grown-ups, I didn't make pictures for you this week, so if you want to see them, you might have to move. But children, here, you can see them. So the book is called The Little Book of Joy by His Holiness the Dalai Lama and Archbishop Desmond Tutu. One of us grew up in a little house. One of us grew up in a big house. This is about those two people I just named, the Dalai Lama and Desmond Tutu, and they're growing up, okay? So they're children in this book. Maybe that will make more sense if you know that. Our houses were on opposite sides of the world. Often we were sad and lonely. Both of us wished for a friend. Sometimes the other kids wouldn't let us play, or they were very far away. We wondered if we would always be sad and lonely. But when we sat still and breathed in the quiet, we noticed something beautiful. If you just focus on the thing that is making you sad, then sadness is all you see. 
But if you look around, you will see that joy is everywhere. Joy is the warm, tingling feeling of the sun tickling your toes in the morning. It's the giggly, squiggly feeling when you are doing something silly. Do you ever do anything silly? And it's the soft, snuggly feeling of being all wrapped up cozy in your bed at night. Even when you are caught in the rain and your joy is washed away, it's waiting for you at the bottom of the puddle. Even if you slam the door and your joy can't get in, it's just on the other side waiting in a loving hug. And even if there is a loud noise in the night and your joy gets scared away, even if there's a loud noise in the night and your joy gets scared away, it comes streaming right back with the light of the silvery moon. Joy is the bubbly, bouncy feeling of finding a good friend. And once you let joy in, like magic, your heart always has room for more. We discovered that the more joy we shared, the more joy we had. And the more joy we had, the more joy we could share. So look for the joy all around you and share it. Can you think of a way you can share joy? Anybody? I think they're going to tell us. I was going to let you say the answers first. Okay, so they say, look for the joy all around you and share it. You can write it in a letter. Play it on a drum. Sing it to the sky. It will travel up in the air, across the ocean. Soon someone will find it and share it. And as it spreads from person to person to person, the world will fill with joy. You can write it in a letter. You can, what, what were the other ones? Sing it to the sky. And what was the one in the middle? Play it on a drum. What if you don't play the drums? Play it on the piano. What else? Stamp your feet, Bien says. Snap your fingers. There's lots of ways to share joy. The one of the ways we always, almost always share joy is by smiling at each other, right? But what if you have a mask on? Smile with your eyes. Yeah, I know. Some of us know how to do that, and some of us don't, right, Gwen? So think about how to share joy with somebody today. Thank you, Bien, for sharing the book with us. You can go back to your seats. First, the first scripture, is this on? Is this on? Okay. Okay. The first scripture is in Philippians chapter 4, verses 10 to 13. And Paul is speaking to the people in Philippi. In my life in union with the Lord, it is a great joy to me that after so long a time, you once more had the chance of showing that you care for me. I don't mean that you had stopped caring for me. You just had no chance to show it. And I am not saying this because I feel neglected, for I have learned to be satisfied, to be satisfied with what I have. I know that it is 
I know what it is to be in need and what it is to have more than enough. I have learned this secret so that anywhere, at any time, I am content whether I am full or hungry, whether I have too much or too little. I have the strength to face all conditions by the power that Christ gives me. The second scripture is in Mark chapter 10, verses 17 to 31. <clears throat> As Jesus was starting his way again, a man ran up, kneeled before him, and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to receive eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus asked him. No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not commit murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not accuse anyone falsely. Do not cheat. Respect your father and your mother. Teacher, the man said, ever since I was young, I have obeyed all these commandments. Jesus looked straight at him with love and said, you need only one thing, go and sell all you have and give the money to the poor and you will have riches in heaven. Then come and follow me. When the man heard this, gloom spread over his face and he went away sad because he was very rich. Jesus looked around at his disciples and said to them, how hard it will be for rich people to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were shocked at these words. But Jesus went on to say, my children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is much harder for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God than for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. At this, the disciples were completely amazed and asked one another, who then can be saved? Jesus looked straight at them and answered, this is impossible for man, but not for God. Everything is possible for God. Then Peter spoke up, look, we have left everything and followed you. Yes, Jesus said to them, and I tell you that anyone who leaves home or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or feels for me and for the gospel will be who will receive much more in his present age, he will receive a thousand times more houses, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, and fields, and persecutions. <clears throat> and in the age to come, he will receive eternal life but, by, but many who are now first will be last, and many who are now last will be first.
invite you to share joys and concerns of your life with your faith community. We'll start with people in the room, and I invite you to come to this microphone to share. Let's pray together. Holy friend, you heal the sick, comfort the sad, rebuke the oppressors, offer hope to the despairing, we lift to you this world with its outrageous injustices and yet also its outpouring of human kindness from ordinary people. God of amazing, rebounding love, let your blessing be upon those who serve their neighbors without thought of reward, who forgive their enemies, who care for broken strangers as if they were dearest friends, who weep with the grieving as if they were sisters, who heal the sick and diseased, not counting the risk to themselves. Let your blessing encourage those who work for peace when the only result seems to be more violence, those who preach and live the gospel in the face of persecution, who feed the hungry although their efforts get misinterpreted, who stand up for the down, downtrodden in spite of public scorn, and who serve your church when those around belittle it. God of compassion and mercy, we have named before you some very deep needs. Hear our prayers, pursue with her diagnosis of cancer, here are prayers for friends who we haven't seen here in a long time, and we miss them. For Sandy and her husband recovering themselves and taking on the major work to downsize. For those who are aging gracefully, modeling a way for us, and for those who are aging, maybe not so gracefully. We pray for those around the world who will benefit from gifts given by this church and many, many other churches pooling our resources. We hold before you the people of Myanmar and Yemen and Mexico, and Venezuela, and Ukraine, and Russia, and South Africa. The list is long, God. We hold before you this planet that we call home. We pray for Ian, praying for effective therapies 
and for more days of feeling really, really good than the other kind. For Connie, And for the stories that hit the news faster than we can keep up with them about people, human beings, whose lives are taken by gun violence, and for the living whose lives are devastated by that violence. Holy One, please reach out your hand over each of us gathered here now, that our faith may be enlarged and fortified, our vision extended, our compassion refreshed and widened. We pray through Jesus of Nazareth, whose love was good enough for the simple and too much for the proud and powerful and absolutely amazing for all who shared his cup. Amen. Paul Kimmermer is a Potawatomi professor and scientist who writes lovely books about plants which are easily understood by non-scientists. She is the author of the bestseller Braiding Sweetgrass and some of us have met her through her longtime friends Kathy and Judy. During the first winter of the pandemic, she wrote a beautiful essay about a kind of fruit called a service berry. You might know it by that name or another name like Juneberry or Saskatoon. In this essay, she explains that her neighbor, Polly, invited Robin to come and pick service berries on Polly's farm. Polly had planted her service berry orchard as a pick your own place, a way to create another revenue stream for her farm. But during the first pandemic lockdown, she invited her neighbors to come and pick all they wanted for free. And as the sweet ripe service berries plunked into her bucket, Robin wondered what she would do with this abundance. And she describes it as a gift economy. The orchard is not free. Planting, tilling, irrigating, those things cost real money. But the neighbor is giving away its bounty. Kimmerer writes, gratitude and reciprocity are the currency of a gift economy. And they have the remarkable property of multiplying with every exchange. Their energy concentrating as they pass from hand to hand, a truly renewable resource. I accept the gift from the bush and then spread that gift with a dish of berries to my neighbor, 
who makes a pie to share with his friend, who feels so wealthy in food and friendship that he volunteers at the food pantry. You know how that goes. In a gift economy, she says, wealth is understood as having enough to share and the practice for dealing with abundance is to give it away. Well, first century Palestine did not have a gift economy. They had an extractive economy. The capital city, Jerusalem, was organized and ordered by the urban elites who were wealthy. And their lifestyle depended on the lower classes in the city and on the peasant farmers in Galilee. Jesus, in this story that we heard, Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem for what will be the last time. And all kinds of people are following him and coming up to him, asking questions, seeking healing for themselves or for others. And this one man comes with a religious question. This story is pretty familiar to most of us. We don't know the man's name, so we often call him the rich young ruler. Mark doesn't describe him as a ruler or as young, and we only find out at the very end that he's rich. But I think we call him the rich young ruler so that we can keep our distance from him. We want to think that we are faithful, which we think he is not, and we want to think that we are not rich. Now, rich and poor are relative terms. To put them into perspective, some economists suggest that an American household of two adults with an annual after-tax income of $40,000, two adults, $40,000, is in the top 7% of the wealth in the world. That's kind of hard to believe, isn't it? And this data is from a few years ago, so there's a little bit of wiggle room. But the point is that all of us here, even though we represent a variety of households with a variety of incomes, we are among the most well-off people in the world. We are rich. And if we can't consider the possibility that we are a lot like the man in this story, then we should probably ask, why not? Barbara Brown Taylor says that Christians mangle this story in at least two ways. First, she says, by acting as if it were not about money. And second, by acting as if it were only about money. It is definitely about money. When the man leaves Jesus, the open question is what he will do with his wealth, whether he will keep it or share it. It is not only about money, because to give away money will be to give away something of himself. We get money by investing ourselves in some physical or mental activity that we call work. When we look at our bank accounts or at the physical pieces of paper in our wallets, we are looking at our invested energy made tangible. Our money represents our, our stored time and talent or that of other people that was handed on to us. So money gets tied up with our sense of worth and how we value our time and how we are valued by others. And it's not just about the stack of bills or the numbers on a page. When this man comes to Jesus to ask about eternal life, he does come as someone with a lot of wealth, but that is not all that he is. He comes as a religious seeker, someone who wants to live the best possible life he can. He comes as someone who has been morally upright. He's a good citizen, a faithful person. He is such a rule keeper that he has undoubtedly given all the tithes that were required of him. The temple has no complaints about him. He's probably in their list of top donors. And Jesus looks at him and loves him. 
The Gospels only describe Jesus as loving two particular people. Now we know that Jesus loved a lot of people, but we're only told about two particular ones. Uh, one is the unnamed beloved disciple in John's Gospel, and the other one is this man. Jesus looks at him and sees him. Sees him still looking for something he hasn't found, still insecure in spite of his wealth, and Jesus loves him. So Jesus reminds him of the short list of commandments, the ones that have to do with how people relate to their neighbors, not the ones about how people relate to God. Jesus says, you know the commandments, do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not bear false witness, check, 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 the man is ticking them all off. And then Jesus changes one of them. Next in the list that Jesus is quoting from, it should say, do not covet. Do not covet means don't be obsessed with what other people have. Don't be jealous of it. Don't make it your goal to get it. But Jesus doesn't say do not covet. Jesus says do not defraud. Or in the translation that Pat read, it says do not cheat. Why would Jesus do that? Why would he replace do not covet with do not defraud. Remember the man's presenting question? What must I do to inherit eternal life? This man had no doubt inherited much of what he owned. And since most of what made people rich in those days was owning property, we can assume that Mark, uh, that when Mark says he had many possessions, what it means is he had many properties. This was an extractive economy where landowners became wealthy by acquiring the land of their neighbors who went into debt. Their neighbors who went into debt and either had to sell the land to pay the debts or had their land taken. It's reasonable to assume that anyone who had many properties was wealthy at the expense of others. It was perfectly legal and not considered cheating or fraudulent, especially not by the religious and political powerful people who designed and kept the system running. But Jesus changes the commandment there. And I have to wonder if he is inviting the man to step out of this system that made him rich at the expense of others. The man cannot single-handedly dismantle the economic systems of Rome and Jerusalem. But Jesus is giving him a window, an opportunity, a possibility of investing in Jesus' alternative gift economy. So Jesus tells him to go and sell what he has and give the proceeds away to the poor and then come back and follow Jesus. And I have always been led to believe that the man doesn't do this. That his wealth has too big a hold on his life. But here's the thing. We don't know what he does. It says he goes away grieving. So maybe he's grieving. Because it will be hard to give up that surround sound TV that his friends enjoy. Maybe he's grieving because it will be hard to sell that vacation home where he and his family made so many great memories. Maybe it is difficult at this stage of his life to reevaluate all the ways that he has invested his time and talent. He followed the rules. He provided for his family. And maybe he's grieving because he realizes that he has been clueless about his exploitation of others. In our anti-racism conversations, we have talked about how wealth and privilege often insulate white people from knowing how our actions affect others. And when we do come to realize that, some of us grieve. 
Not to put too fine a point on it, but if we aren't willing to consider the similarities between this man and ourselves, we might want to ask ourselves, why not? He goes away grieving. But whether he does what Jesus suggests or not, we just don't know. It remains an open question for him and therefore for us. In that essay about the service Barry Kimmerer writes, in a gift economy, wealth is understood as having enough to share, and the practice for dealing with abundance is to give it away. In fact, status is determined not by how much accumulates, how much one accumulates, but status is determined by how much one gives away. So this cycle of blessings which we are exploring this month seems much more like the gift economy that Robin Kimmerer describes. Here, truth and wellness and relationship flow along with money to enhance the well-being of the whole community. A quick story. Many years ago, Joan Chittister, who is a writer spiritual director. She attended an international conference in Asia on the status of women, and most of the participants were women that she describes as well-funded activist types. They were all there at this conference to professionally analyze various women's issues around the world, especially the needs of women in developing countries. And at this gathering, these professional activist type women called for more education for girls, more birth control training, better healthcare programs, and most importantly, more participation of women at all levels of the political process. So they'd been at this conference, getting to know each other, hearing each other's stories, understanding the issues. And as the conference was drawing to a close, a leader of one of the small group workshops passed around a piece of paper. She asked everyone to share their email address so that they could all stay in contact and support each other in their work. One of the participants was a woman named Rose. She was a Kenyan uh, pastor of a Presbyterian church. And when the piece of paper came to her, she put her name on it and then passed it along. And the woman next to her passed the paper back to Rose and pointed out that she hadn't put in an email address. And Rose answered, I don't have email where I am. It is too expensive for us. So the conference ended and Sister Joan and her colleague were getting into a cab to leave and her colleague said that she needed to run back and see Rose. So she asked Sister Joan to wait and she rushed back into the hotel saying that she had promised to give Rose something. And then later when they got to the airport and they were waiting to check into their flight, Sister Joan said, what was that? What did you give to Rose? And the colleague said, that she gave Rose her credit card. Your credit card? Why in heaven's name would you give Rose your credit card? Her friend answered quietly, so she can pay for her email every month. This story is about money, but it's not only about money. It's about relationship. It's about the well-being of the community. It's about how we choose to invest our time and energy. Next Sunday, you have already heard that we have two important opportunities. Within worship, we will make financial pledges to the ministry and well being of this congregation. You will receive a letter this week with a, um, an old school hard copy pledge card and also with instructions for how you can pledge online. Both options are equally good. The choice is up to you. And also next Sunday, we will be hosting these conversations with our consultant. The conversations are framed as being about our future together, the future that God is calling us into. 
but it would also be accurate to say that they are conversations about the cycle of blessings and how we circulate holy currencies. We invest our money, our relationships, our gratitude in Jesus' alternative economy, which we try to imitate within this congregation. We do so in the hopes of embodying the reign of God among us, not perfectly, not all at once, but like a seed hidden in a field, like yeast buried in a lump of dough, because with God, all things are possible. Amen. Our closing hymn may be unfamiliar, but we have sung it before. It is uh, number 686, God of Our Life. I invite you to rise in body and spirit as we sing. Thank you as always for your presence and participation in worship. I invite you to uh, join in coffee hour, greet each other, grab a cup of coffee or whatever is in there. And now would you receive a benediction? May the Lord Christ go before you to prepare your way. Christ beside you be companion to you everywhere you go. Christ beneath you to strengthen and sustain you when you fall or fail. Christ behind you to finish and complete what you must leave undone. Christ within you to give you courage and hope, faith and love, but mostly Christ above bless and keep you now and evermore. Amen.